All right, welcome. Good to see everybody here. Uh, uh, Sunday afternoon, everyone got some food, got some lunch. Uh, we're here to hear about Ben's sabbatical. So uh, we're being live streamed as well. So we'll um, hopefully have some people that are watching from home. I have a little bit of a cold. So you may notice I'm sniffling here, so I'll try to stay away from you all um, afterwards. But um, first off, I just want to say um, I want to appreciate and acknowledge all the folks that uh, made the sabbatical happen, um, from Ben's family to uh, Rachel and her family, uh, to all the volunteers, to our guest speakers. Uh, and I know just there are a number of other people just put a little bit of extra in to kind of make it work. Um, so just want to thank and acknowledge all of them. And, uh, and I'm so grateful that we get this time today to uh, hear from Ben a little bit about his sabbatical and, and what it meant to him, what he learned. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. So I think we're going to um, have a time for some questions as well at the end. Is that right, Ben? I think so. If you have some questions that come up, we'll uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll uh, try to engage that way and just see how this goes. So I think I'd like to kick this off, Ben. Um, and I got a couple of questions here for you. So and, and you can take them however you want. Um, how did you prepare for your sabbatical? What was it like to prepare for your sabbatical? And what were you kind of hoping for from your sabbatical? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Bob. Thanks, for everybody, for coming and being a part of this. Thanks for those of you who are joining online, uh, either right now in this moment or at some later moment. It's good to have you with us. Um, yeah, preparing for the sabbatical. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, one part of the preparation for the sabbatical was to be in conversation with you and the rest of the council and to do some education about what a sabbatical is. So that was part of it. Um, sometimes I think people see as a sabbatical as just a extra long vacation. Uh, and there certainly are uh, um, elements of a sabbatical that feel like a vacation, but it really should be an intentional time of rest. Um, and not just a getting away, but a kind of a moving into a different kind of place. So along those lines, I really had to ask myself, like, so how do I want to spend this? I've been on, in my career, I've been on two sabbaticals before. Um, the last one was 10 years ago now. Um, Brooke, who's here today, and Marin, uh, and my daughter Sophia and I, we all went to South Africa for three months. And we had, we had gotten a grant to do that. Um, uh, that wasn't in the cards this time around. The, I'm no longer eligible for that grant. And, you know, our kids as teenagers are super busy. Um, and Brooke works full time. So having that kind of uh, adventure wasn't really in the cards. So I thought, well, how do I want to spend the time? And I know that for a long time I have wanted to develop a writing practice. And by saying that, by develop a writing practice, it's different than saying, I want to write a book or I want to get published. Um, uh, it's, it's about like, w how can I like create patterns in my life and in my activity where I'm writing on a regular basis that may or may not become anything published, but that really is primarily, you know, for me as a creative expression. And if other people find value in it, great, but that's not the first thing that I'm um, looking at. So I, I think I started by making a big long list of all of the things that I kind of hope to uh, explore over the course of the three months. And I would say I touched on just about every one of them. What, um, what surprised you about your sabbatical? So you kind of went in probably with these expectations, things you wanted to do or, or experience, and you had your, 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 your list there. Was there anything that kind of surprised you about your sabbatical? Yeah, I think two things. Um, one is I thought I would get more depressed uh, than I did. Um, and I say that because I know myself. If, I'm, if, I don't, if I feel like I'm not um, engaged in activity and feeling like I have things to do and working a list of things, uh, you know, for the day that I, I get kind of unmoored and um, anxious and then I end up feeling depressed. Um, and that didn't happen. It, to the extent that I thought it would. It, it did happen, um, uh, some, uh, but enough that I could kind of pay attention to it and, 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 and kind of move through it rather quickly. I wrote, I wrote a poem on it that I, I can read in a little bit. Um, so that's one thing that surprised me. I think 
the other thing was I had hoped to go on several in-person retreats, and it just, that did not pan out. I think because of COVID, there weren't many in-person writing retreats happening. There were some, but um, uh, so I ended up going on one the very last week of the sabbatical, but the rest of it, you know, I was in or around town, and um, I also did an online uh, course that ended up being very important to me, but I, I wasn't planning on that ahead of time. I, I discovered it um, after the sabbatical had already begun. So, um, so the online course, can you tell me what's like something you kind of learned about yourself, about the church um, during your time and your sabbatical? Yeah, um, I think <laughs> going into it, I thought, I thought, okay, here you go. You're gonna start writing, and I, I did. Um, every morning during the sabbatical, I wrote morning pages, the very first thing in the morning. Some of you may have done this um, through the artist's way with Julia Cameron. I did that like, gosh, 25 years ago. So, so I knew how to do it. And the idea is you get up in the morning and before you do anything else, you just write three pages of stream of thought writing. You don't let your hands stop. Uh, so I would, I would get up and I would uh, put on my writing cap which uh, Judy Hawkins made for me. So I'd put this cap on, and I would sit at the same place at the dining room table that I would always sit, and I'd pull out my, my composition book, and I, I alternated between three colors of pen. Each, each day I would go to the next color just to kind of keep those divided visually for me, and I would, I would just start writing. Um, and I, I discovered that you know, writing is primarily about just doing it. Um, in the course I took was by um, Natalie Goldberg, who wrote Writing Down the Bones. And um, I've had this book, this tiny little book, uh, on my shelf for, I don't know, 15 years. I think Brooke was the one who said, didn't, didn't your friend Jenny give that to you? And I since uh, texted Jenny and I said, did you ever give me a tiny little version of Writing Down the Bones? She goes, yeah, I probably did that. So I started reading it. I thought, this is great. This is, this is what I've been needing <laughs> for 15 years. Why didn't I read this before? So um, then uh, Brooke's mom, so my mother-in-law, told me, Natalie Goldberg is leading an online course called Writing Down the Bones, uh, Finding the Voice Within. And um, so I took the course. And I, I, it just confirmed what I knew, what I thought I knew, which is the reason I wasn't writing was because I was uh, thinking too much about it, about what I was gonna write. And I was too wrapped up in my ego. In other words, I didn't wanna write something that wasn't worthwhile. And so I would sit down and I'd be like, I'll do it later. And I would wait to get inspired. And if you wait to get inspired to write, you usually don't write much. So, um, so Natalie would say things like, uh, you need to, you do not wait to get inspired. Uh, do not think about whether it's good. Uh, you can use a writing prompt and then just start writing and get ready to produce a lot of crap. You're gonna fill like entire notebooks full of crap that you wouldn't want, don't wanna share with anyone, wouldn't want anybody to read or anything. But you go back and read it and you're like, huh, that's an interesting phrase. Or wow, this page, did I write that? that that's good. Or, um, or, or you, you find a little phrase and you're like, huh, I tried to write a poem here and the poem didn't really, you know, do it, but that phrase is, that might be a good poem. So you start with that one and then you have a poem. You're like, oh, okay, here we go. So it was, it's not a linear thing. It's not like I have an idea, I'm inspired, now I'm gonna write something good that's worth reading. It's, I'm gonna start writing some stuff and in writing stuff, I'm gonna be paying attention to my, the way my own mind works. And, and then I'm gonna follow where it leads me. So I followed it and it took me to all kinds of places. Some comfortable, some not so comfortable, some beautiful, some ugly, some understandable, some perplexing. But that's what I've ultimately found out in the writing practice is that it's not really about producing anything someone else will like. That's a secondary benefit. It's primarily about discovering who you are and theologically kind of 
discovering um, who, who I am in God and who I'm being led to be, what I'm discovering myself to be in God. Um, so the purpose of the writing is more kind of self-discovery for you then? Was that, what would you say the purpose when you think about why you, why you chose to develop a writing practice? And, and I guess two questions. So what was your initial kind of intention? And then is it any different now after you've kind of been working on this practice for all this time? <coughs> yeah, I, I would definitely would say that self-discovery was a, a hope and that happened. I also think it's, it's about um, discovering beauty, which, you know, I suppose that anything I discover is in myself. But sometimes you, you discover something, you find something beautiful or a phrase or something, and you're like, wow, I, I have no idea where that came from. And, uh, early on, um, when, I, when I started trying to write some poems, I would write a poem, and I'd, I'd have the voice there like, that's not very good. But then I, I got, very quickly I got to the point where like, well, whether it's good or not, like that poem I just read, wrote has never existed in the history of humanity. Like no one has ever written that poem. Whether or not it's any good, whether anybody else would, and then you realize that to be involved in the creative process is not about impressing anyone. It's about ta tapping into kind of deep structures in, in my own being and in our shared being, and that's enough. I mean, other stuff could come out of that, but that in and of itself was enough. So the, the first poem that I wrote and posted on my blog was called, This Is Not a Poem. I, actually, I read that Did one. you read that yes. one? Yes. Yeah, that was like day two or something like that. It was like I almost couldn't even admit yet that I was going to try to write poetry. But I had to write that one before I could write any other one read that one, and then I read the next one, then I read the next one, and I was like, oh my god, he's not going to stop. <laughs> so I kept up yeah. the first, I think, week or so, and then I realized he was really serious about this writing <laughs> thing, so, but uh, I appreciated it. Um, ben, did you want to share anything in terms yeah. of the poems? It's a good time for that, just we've been talking about the poetry. I, I don't know if you want to share anything at yeah, this point. I yeah, I thought I would share some others. Um, I also just want to share, so I, I shared one of the gifts that a member of this church gave to me um, that kind of grounded me. Um, uh, another one was uh, Joanne Matson um, embroidered me a bookmark that says Shabbat Shalom on it. And so that held my place in my morning page book every morning. So I'd, I'd put on my Judy hat and I'd take out my uh, Joanne bookmark and start writing. Um, and the other thing um, I did was I created a, a blog. I have my own website couldn't believe that benjaminbroadbent.com wasn't taken yet. Um, <laughs> but one of the first posts, actually maybe the first or second one, included uh, Muriel Weaver's uh, collage that she gave me just before I left, and Muriel's here. Um, and it says uh, sabbatikos in Greek letters at the bottom. And um, you can come and look at it later if you like, but there's basically a, a wooden walkway kind of leading out to a, a doorway or an opening uh, and in one of those early um, blog entries, I talked about um, that this, this was a wonderful image for sab sabbaticos for me. Like, it, it's restful, but it's full of light, and it leads somewhere, but you only know by walking it. Uh, so thank you, uh, Muriel, for, for, that, um, for that image. So those were some, some gifts. Um, yeah, I thought I would read some of my poems, and those of you who followed who followed the blog, and several of you are here. Gosh, Norma I was very diligent about reading, and I saw Sandy on there, and other, uh, others. I could probably name all of you who are here. Um, so thank you for following those. So some of these will be familiar, um, but maybe you haven't heard them in my voice yet. And so I, I thought I would do that. Um, so one of my goals was to find a new Sonoma County hike every week. So I was walking in Shiloh Ranch Regional Park uh, all by myself one day, and I, I just started noticing how amazing the oak trees are in this county. I, I, I almost found myself like, like, am I falling in love with oak trees? Like, they, they all have personalities. Um, if you've looked at them for any amount of time, like, there are no two of them are the same, and they, 
express all kinds of things. And I came across this one oak tree that for whatever reason had fallen, but, but didn't die. So it had fallen, and then it had new limbs that grew straight up again. So I also thought, like, yeah, not all trees are a trunk with branches. Some trees, I saw one, is a trunk with branches. <laughs> it's a completely different um, uh, way of looking at a tree. So, oh, and this is a new thing. This is a new thing I need to do now. Um, so I wrote this about a, uh, a live oak tree that had fallen but refused to die. I want to be like this tree, this live oak here in this canyon. I want to fall like it fell, to be caught by the same soft ground. Toppled, it sees the world anew from below. It has new friends with new needs, a lizard seeking refuge, a pill bug licking its pill bug lips waiting for the tree to die and return to the lovely loam from which it once emerged. I want to look the lizard in the eye and stop the bug mid-lick and reach up once, twice, three times with new limbs rising from my fallen self, still alive. Um, and then I, a couple days later, I went down to, um, I think I wrote this one at Tole Lake, which is an interesting park. It's all flat. <laughs> uh, but there are golden eagles circling there. They, they nest in the telephone poles. Um, but I, I was thinking about, I was thinking about Mary Oliver and that I just really love her poetry. And I had, the, the thought went by me like, I wonder, did she ever write any bad poems? And if she did, like, would we ever, like, she wouldn't publish any of the bad poems. We just get to read all the great ones. And I thought, she must have published, or she must have written some really bad poems, you know, in addition to the really wonderful poems. Um, so I, I was imagining that and struggling with my own ego, which I mentioned uh, when I wrote this poem. And it's called Horrible. I want to stumble upon a cache of horrible poems by Mary Oliver. But before learning that she was, in fact, the person who wrote them, I want to laugh at them, to guffaw and tisk and shake my head. Hey, listen to this, I will shout at someone across the room, and then I'll read a particularly trite or pedestrian phrase. Finally, I'll vocalize one of my signature breathy, derisive scoffs. Once I have performed all of my pharisaic disdain, I want to discover her initials on one of the pages. And I want it to dawn upon me slowly, slowly what I've done and whose poems these were. The one who penned, you do not have to be good. And then I want to know in my bones what it's like to be a gull who finds just the right pocket of air to lift herself aloft without effort. I, um, I think I've talked in sermons before about the creek behind our house. I, I realized that like, I think if somebody just kind of walked along there for the first time, I don't know, depending on the day or whatever, they might not think much of it. They might just think it's some urban creek going through without much to tell. But I think if you learn to pay attention, you learn to love the actual land that you're on. And so I've just fallen in love with this creek, this little urban creek in between Guerneville Road, and then it comes over and goes underneath Fulton, that little stretch. I have names for various of the trees. I've seen otters. Brooke and I have seen like a great horned owl, uh, something like a mink or a muskrat or something that we don't 
No, there are turtles in there. Um, but I wrote this poem. Um, I was having a day where I was feeling some eco grief. It's kind of a, aware of climate change and what has been lost and what threats there are and how things have changed and was feeling some despair. And I had this thought, but still so much of the world works. It's still working. S some, stuff, some stuff is broken and destroyed, but still so much of it is working. So, so this, um, this poem is called, While Still So Much of the World Works. <clears throat> While still so much of the world works, while Piner Creek still giggles as it flows, while the coastal oak guards its leaves and the valley oak gives them away, while the hooded merganser and her mate return to this brook bend again this year, let us not fail to love that which asks nothing from us but close attention. Do you hunt? He wears a camo fleece and matching cap. Nope. Where is this going? Look at this bobcat. He pulls out his phone and shows me the unmistakable jackrabbit haunches. You'll never guess what I saw last week about a quarter mile down. I looked my wonderment at him. A steelhead. It made its way up from the ocean. And then he showed me with his hands. It was yay big. And I can still see that so much of the world works. While still so much of the world works, unlike the days of Noah, when God had had enough, when there was not one kind human to be found, today, kindnesses are everywhere, if you know where to look, though news of them gains little advertisement. So let us advertise this. While still so much of the world works, we who are in and of the world will look for all the kindnesses, naming them out loud to each other as we tread ever so softly upon all that we love and that loves us in return. And I'll read one more and then maybe open up for some questions and I, ca I can read more if folks want that too. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have different walks that we walk in our neighborhood, as I'm sure you do. Um, we have a couple of wiener dogs and try to mix it up. And, <laughs> and um, kind of, it kind of has to do with how much time you have, right? Like, well, if I have this much time, I'll walk this long. So one of, on one of the walks, um, this, you know, Piner Creek, on the, is on the backside of all these houses. So you kind of get to look into a lot of people's backyards. And this one house, um, I was startled one day to look in, and there was a woman there, and she waved at me. And it just became a thing we started doing. I have no idea what her name is. We've never introduced ourselves. She always waves at me and smiles, so I wrote a poem about it. <clears throat> there is a woman who sits alone at her table next to her picture window and eats breakfast, like most of us. But this woman lingers over poached eggs, keeps vigil over buttered toast, ponders two pork links, recalling every morning the one love with whom she was linked for so long. She waits and watches over her backyard glancing through the hedge, peering onto the public trail where I walk my dogs nearly every day. On one such day, I looked up and saw her in her comfy robe, a practical hairnet, and, I imagine, well-worn house slippers. Then, out of nowhere, she heroically crossed the infinite distance between us and waved. Just like that, no grand gesture, waved the wave and smiled the smile of someone 
who knows another human being when she sees one. It has now become our ritual, she and I, and perhaps countless others, to see and to smile and to wave, just like that, not knowing each other's name nor story, not needing to, just looking through both sides of a window and acknowledging, I see you there. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> so we'll open it up. Any, I have a whole bunch more questions, by the way. I can throw at them, but uh, we'll open it up and see if there's some questions from um, anyone out there. And uh, if you can speak up, that'd be great, and I'll try to repeat it. Yep. What was difficult to leave sabbatical to come back to your full-time job? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I'm, I'm pausing because it wasn't really that hard, honestly. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I read something really important in the last week. Um, uh, some, a book I was reading called uh, Failure of Nerve by Edwin Friedman. He said in it, um, often, you know, pastors or clergy will take sabbaticals and they see it as kind of like a time to recharge the batteries so they can then just jump back into work and run the batteries all the way down again and then gasp for breath until they can have a sabbatical. <laughs> and I took that as a challenge. I thought, yeah, I don't want to do that. Uh, this wasn't just a vacation. This wasn't just recharging my batteries. Like, I developed a new, new patterns in my own behavior, my own practices, my own psyche in a way. So I thought, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm coming back from sabbatical, back into work, but I'm, I'm not the same person. Uh, I'm not uh, going to perpetuate all of the same patterns. Now, I've noticed since I've been back, like I'm getting tugged. I feel it, right? But I'm aware of it. And I, I realized, like, okay, I don't, I, I don't need to do those same, those same patterns again. So, um, you know, the, the last week of my sabbatical I spent at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. And it was perfect. Uh, it was perfect that I saved that to last. Like, I had, that way the, the sabbatical kind of ended on a high note. Like, something I was really looking forward to. And it was, you know, away from home and away from California. And it was a completely different space. And I just kind of set the atten intention, like I'm, you know, during this week at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, in a writing course, I'm preparing myself to return. Not, I'm trying to not think about returning for another week, but I'm actually going to use this time to prepare to return. Um, and so I think it didn't surprise me then, coming back, like I really was being intentional about it. So I'm not, I'm not meaning to evade your <laughs> question, Bobby, but it, it, it wasn't really that, it wasn't really that hard to come back. And I, and I had energy, too. I was, I was excited. I am excited. All right. You feel free to take the mask off if you need to speak just for a second, yeah. Are you going to carry on with the blog? Yes. Uh, I have, my, my, my writing frequency has dropped. Uh, Norma would know that because she's been a regular reader. Thank you. Um, but yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue. And I've already done two, since, since coming back from sabbatical, I've already done a couple of posts. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for that. I'll just repeat it for the sake of folks who I, Norma was just saying that she, she liked the regularity of reading the posts because it was like being the woman in the window, that connection where there's a kind of a, the regular rhythm of the connection. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've already noticed like the kind of busyness creeping in and then it becoming like, okay, well, I guess I don't have time to, and uh, Natalie Goldberg was like, she'd be like, just write. Like, you, you, you have, do you have 10 minutes? Don't wait to be inspired. Just write. And 
if you can do that a few times, one of those, you might think, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll type this out and post it. It doesn't have to be, what I hear you saying, it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't even have to be good, just the, the connection. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, Gar. This is going to repeat for the for the live stream. Did you gain any insights that would influence your teaching or or the, your life in the church here? Yeah, I did. Um, I think one thing I did over the course of the sabbatical, I, I thought a lot about anxiety, actually. Uh, my own anxiety and the anxiety within any system, any any marriage or partnership, any family, any community, including a church. There's anxiety in our whole culture. There's global anxiety. I thought a lot about it. Um, I had, um, I won't, I won't, it was not an anxiety attack, but I had an upswell of anxiety when Russia invaded Ukraine. And I mentioned this in my sermon last week that for me, I, I thought, oh, th I've, I'm really missing community right now because I, I think community can play a role in absorbing ang the individual anxiety because it's shared and, and it can have a role of absorbing it and kind of lowering it. Community can also have a role of ratcheting <laughs> anxiety up. I, in that kind of thing, I was missing, I was missing community. So I, I've thought a lot about that and I've thought and I've read about what's called family systems theory, um, which Pastor Rachel is uh, much more uh, educated in than I am. She really has kind of reintroduced it to me. But I realized that as a pastor, I don't have to take on other people's anxiety. Um, in fact, if I do, I'm taking something away from somebody that belongs to them. <laughs> um, what I need to do is I need to manage my own anxiety and I need to self-define so that I'm clear on where I am and I need to stay connected to people. So that became kind of a mantra for me. Like, manage your own anxiety, self-define, stay connected. Um, and so that's part, that's one of those patterns that I want to bring back into my, into my leadership is to be less anxious in my leadership and not try to fix other people's anxiety. Because I don't do it well. I don't think any of us fix each other's anxiety well. Um, so that, that, that's a, a major thing. I also, um, I think I learned um, in the writing practice that, I mean, perfection is impossible. We're just, we're just who we are the best we can be. And so we should just be invited to do the best we can, express ourselves the best we can, and have a lot of grace for ourselves and each other. And so I think that's a message I want to bring to the church, is like, let's just like be ourselves and try stuff and encourage each other. And like fail miserably together. And be surprised when we actually accomplish something. <laughs> just go for it. So those, those are things, a couple of things that come to mind. So. Other questions? I could read a couple more uh, poems here. Hmm. Mm hmm. So I'll repeat it. So have you thought about sharing your poems with the subject, such as the putting it on the tree or in the woman's backyard? I, I had not thought of that. An, yeah. It's interesting. You know, like uh, about the woman that I waved to, like, you know, I projected my own ideas. I have no idea whether she, you know, so I wouldn't, that's why I would hesitate from sharing that poem with her. Um, but what I hear you say, Vicki, is that, you know, poems can be shared in a variety of ways. Um, they're gifts, yeah. And, you know, maybe they could be shared in public and without even knowing how they would be received. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like it's a creative idea. I like it. Yeah. Kind of makes me think of like an art exhibit when people exhibit their art. You know, they right. Their art out there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I um, when I went to Helen Putnam Regional Park. Um, boy, my iPhone takes the most incredible pictures of California poppies. Um, I would often I would often put the uh, a photo that I took on the hike, like in the post. And this one of California, it was just amazing. They were like, the detail in it, and then you can, the, the, the smattering of them in the background and everything. Um, Chris Chang Weeks is here. She, she ma takes incredible photos with her <laughs> iPhone that she puts on our, um, on our all church emails and stuff like that. So I, I got into that, um, Chris. Um, so here, here's a poem called Sex Outside My Door with poppies uh, as the picture. I walked out my front door yesterday, and the scent of sex clapped me full in the face. I looked around to spy the source, half expecting a Casanova crouching in the bushes. All I found was a shrub, covered with pink coquettes. Looking for a good time, it asked me. Uh, maybe, I said. Well, buzz on over here and give us some sugar, it replied. I don't buzz, I said. Then move along, buddy. I decided not to argue nor to beg. On the sidewalk, I almost collided with airborne sex. It came so close I had to duck. Two shiny blue blobs conjoined and humming at 50 beats per second. Excuse me, I said, but only discerned the softest moan in reply. Crossing the street, I saw sex everywhere. Lizards in mutual pursuit, shameless stamens and pouty pistols and winsome wasps, all throwing themselves at each other. Meanwhile, there in the east was a sultry moon half undressed in the middle of the day. Wandering home, I wondered what to do with my restless self. So in love with the world, so filled with desire for all that lies just outside my door. I wondered how church people would respond to a poem with sex in the title. I, I saw the title sitting yeah. there and I wondered, is he gonna get to that one? What'd you say? <laughs> yes, it's great. <laughs> Um, I wrote another poem called The Day I Die. And this, this was um, in Natalie Goldberg's course. So the, the way the classes would happen, the way the class was, it was a, a series of pre-recorded lectures. But then we had some live Zoom interactions. And that would start with sitting meditation for five to 10 minutes, uh, which I really appreciated. And then we would have writing prompts. And so we'd have a prompt, and you'd write for 15 minutes. So I think, I think this prompt might have been, tell us about the day you die. 15 minutes, go. And so you just start writing. I have like tennis elbow from writing now. Uh, and you just keep writing. And, and again, like I mentioned before, a lot of it is crap. A lot of it is, I don't know what I'm writing right now, but I'm moving my hand. It's continuing to move. And then you, then you get somewhere. So this was one of those prompts that then I looked at it afterwards and I thought, I, I think I could turn this into something like a poem. So it's called The Day I Die. And on the picture on it is, um, these aren't my feet, but they could be uh, covered with sand on the beach. Someday I will die. I will die on the beach with its salt scent in my nose, the flies that were swirling orgiastically upon some rotting kelp will catch a whiff of me and will shift over from it to attend to my passing. I will die with wet feet covered in sand, with seagulls squawking out their distinctive dirge, the waves will continue crashing, though I will no longer hear them. 
Six brown pelicans in formation will glide along the crest of the next wave about to break. Scarcely moving a wing, they will disappear to the right of me, while the next formation will appear to the left. When I die, children will be playing in the sand, completely unaware of what time it is, or of the dangerous undertow that lurks just beyond the shore break. They will be building dripping towers with delight, while imagining towers that seemingly stand forever and yet will become undone when the next tide comes around. When I die, the sun will be high in the sky. The sand will be hot on top and cool beneath. The cypress trees will stretch their languid limbs to grant me shade to no avail. When I die, my last thoughts will be, how did I get here? What did I do to deserve all this good? Why did I not spend more time simply feeling the sand between my toes, the mist in my nose, the wind as it comes and goes, the timelessness of a day at the beach, a day such as this, the day I die and leave behind every countless grain I've ever known. Taking Vicky's suggestion, I could put this on uh, its beach in Santa Cruz, which is where I was imagining myself <laughs> at the time. And um, yeah, question for you: Was there an experience, like trivial or significant, that you think you'll remember years from now from your sabbatical? Um, something like a moment or something, or uh, something you did that just I know there's certain things in our lives that we kind of remember years later, like vividly. Is there anything like that for you from your sabbatical, big or small? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are a lot of those, a lot of those moments. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm thinking of like five right now. Um, you know, I think having the time, I was able to do some things that I might not otherwise have been able to do. Uh, I'm, I'm turning 50 this year, which means that all of my high school friends are turning 50, uh, one after another. Uh, actually, today would have been the 50th birthday of my friend Pete, who died of colon cancer a few years ago. Um, but being on sabbatical, I was able to go down to Santa Cruz and show up at Branson Forty Park and celebrate the 50th birthday of my best, longest friend. I, I wrote about this in the blog, but um, it was just really nice to be not be rushed and just be able to go down and to do that and be with him and other friends from high school in, in a familiar place. And um, I just realized that like moments like that, they don't happen very often. And if you don't m show up, you miss them. And so I had moments like that. I had moments with my family. The, another thing I was thinking about was um, there was one day when uh, Sophia had a day off and no other plans. And I looked at the map and I thought, the only part of Sonoma County that I think I haven't been to is like, is Gualala. So I was like, we're going to Gualala. <laughs> so, we, so she and I drove to Gualala and we went on like a, I don't know, a three hour hike. And she had also been on a um, backpacking trip over uh, spring break. And you know when you go on a, when you have a significant experience and people ask you about it and you have lots to say and they have about five minutes of attention. I think it kind of, like that kind of happened for Sophia with the backpacking trip. Like we were asking about it and you're interested for a while, but then you know, Stuff is happening, and you move on, and so uh, so for three hours we got to talk about her backpacking trip, and it wouldn't have otherwise happened. Um, so I that's the other kind of moment that I didn't plan on that happened that I'll remember for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Ghost Ranch. Sure. Share about Ghost Ranch. Yeah. 
Right, so Ghost Ranch is a Presbyterian retreat center near Abiquiu, New Mexico, so kind of northwest New Mexico. Uh, it is in a very unique part of the world. Um, it is the place where, near where Georgia O'Keeffe's home was. Uh, she had a cottage on the Ghost Ranch property. You can take a tour which I regret to say I did not, it did not work out for me to take it, where they walk you around and they say, okay, look at this Georgia O'Keeffe painting, and you see the, this dead tree and this cow skull, and then they, they put the painting down, and they say, there's the dead tree, there's the cow skull, <laughs> and you're like, wow. Um, and it's also the geologic formation. Um, my shuttle driver said, New Mexico has been called a study in erosion. So the course I took was called Writing from Antiquity, and our um, teacher, Martha Yates, is an archaeologist uh, and a poet and has a doctorate in, in the Greek classics. <laughs> so she's, her, she has a vast intellect and interest all the way from literature to science to everything, and, and loves writing poetry. So the idea of the course and what we did was she would kind of do talks on the geology and on the cultural history of the area. So we went on a few excursions. One of the excursions was to a Tewa Pueblo, which dated to about the uh, 1300s. And you could kind of get above it and look down and see the imprint of the Pueblo and see where the Kiva was, the sacred indentation in the earth. And um, we saw petroglyphs and talked about Tewa culture and you know, why they had moved on from that place and that there are um, many people today who they, they understand their ancestors have never left that place. So they come and visit that place as a sacred place. We found pottery shards. Uh, all around. Um, so that was one of the aspects of antiquity. Another was we went and visited the most remote monastery in North America, which is the Christ in the Desert Benedictine Monastery that you have to drive along a, a narrow forest service dirt road for about 45 minutes to get to it. It's right along the Chama River uh, and is just a beautiful location and these 20, 23 uh, monks live in that, uh, in that place. And she also taught us about the geology. So like while we were on that drive, she's, she's driving the van, Martha's driving the van and she pulls over and she goes, Ben, why don't you get out and do you, do you see how there's some red soil and some green? Why don't you grab some of the green? I'm like, okay, so I grab the green. It's, it was hot in the sun and hand that around. And she's like, she's like yeah, that, that right there is from... Um, 200 million years ago. It's green because it was once jungle vegetation when this part of the continent was just north of the equator. You know, you're just like, how do I even take all that in while holding this? And she's like, now go grab some of the red stuff. So I went and grabbed the red stuff and she goes, uh, this is 250 million year old Chinle, uh, which is ancient mud flows um, and uh, so things like that. So she would present the antiquity of the cultural history, of the monastery, of the land, and then we would write in the presence of that. It, we didn't write about it, but you, you had that in mind. So uh, l let me read one poem that I wrote while at Ghost Ranch. This was, uh, we were talking about ancestors and to be totally honest, I don't think about ancestors a lot. I think maybe based on this experience, I'll think about ancestors more. <laughs> and, and realizing that like many native people have a very different understanding of ancestors than you know, people from a European background, at least my European background. The ancestors are a presence. Like we were sitting in our meeting room and this kind of, um, we would call it like a dust devil came by and Martha said, you know, um, if I was sitting here with a group of Pueblo people, they would say, that was the ancestors. Like, 
not that might have been, but like, oh yeah, that, that was the ancestors. They just let us know that they were here. So just like a, like a very real presence all the time. So, so I wrote a poem uh, called the Ancestors that's based on my ancestors. You'll, you'll hear me refer to my, my four grandparents in this poem. All around me are my ancestors. All around me, wherever I go, wherever I live, how can that be? How do they travel? How do they know? Evelyn is here, barefoot, embodying good words as she moves upon the church floorboards and out onto the street to follow me, even here. Charles is here with his bookish grumble, his camera-like gaze, capturing moments and crafting arguments. He follows me to keep my thinking clear. Marion is here with her holy worry, her anxious hands, her survivor's heart. The incense of her cigarettes follow me in every waft of smoke I breathe, I breathe, inhaling her exhale. Jack is here, maneuvering his city bus to find me, picking up wayfarers of every color, even those he judged without thinking. Nevertheless, he bore them on along his way to meet me, to stop at the place I had stopped to linger, waiting for him to arrive. On that bus, in that smoky drag, hidden amid those books, formed by that dance, they keep seeking me, wondering if I'm willing to be found. I'm already found in the dance of my days, the flight of my mind, my breathing in pairs, the way I open the doors to allow others to enter my life, to board this bus bound for where? Bound for here, bound for here, filling up with passengers. But there's always more room, always enough seats. The windows are clear but frosted. We are on our way, our breathing fogging up the glass as one reads, one smokes, one drives, and one, in the midst of everything else, dances dances barefoot on the hallowed ground. That was Ghost Ranch. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question, um, Vicki. I'll just repeat it. Uh, thoughts about the, the congregations I visited. Yeah, so I had done this in a previous sabbatical. In fact, it had been kind of a focus of my very first sabbatical where I wanted to explore other faith communities. So this time around, I thought, well, I'll have, I'll have Sundays free. Uh, let, me, let me go and visit some other churches. Uh, and so I did. And, uh, and it was... It's interesting to go and visit a community as a visitor for the first time. I realized that I liked to kind of come in, sit down in the back, not talk to anyone, and leave. And I realized, you know, for many years I've been like, hey, if you're visiting for the first or second time, please stand so we can see who you are. And I'm not, I don't know, I'm kind of torn on that now because I think there's something about, there's something welcoming about letting people kind of come and check it out without that being put on the spot. And uh, I can hear several of you introverts in your hearts saying amen. <laughs> um, so that was one aspect of it. Uh, another aspect of it was it's amazing that virtually every other community is not wearing masks in worship. Um, I went to a few churches that no one was wearing a mask but me. Uh, one where virtually no one, but maybe a few other people. And this 
you know, spanned the kind of ideological spectrum from an evangelical Christian church to an Episcopal church. Um, virtually no, virtually no masks. Um, so that happened. I think um, I was, I had my ears out for things like how do they welcome or acknowledge visitors? What's the sermon like? What's the liturgy like? Um, I realized that uh, evangelical churches have very little liturgy. What I mean by that is it, basically the liturgy, the, the flow of the service, is a welcome, maybe an opening prayer, a bunch of singing, like praise song singing, scripture sermon, maybe a prayer at the end of the sermon, done. Not even necessarily an offering. Um, there was one church I went to on a communion Sunday where communion was, hey, everybody, you got your pre-wrapped communion thing at the door. Um, communion's really important. Let's all take it now. There was no prayer. There was no words of institution. There was no invitation to the table. And um, uh, I'm, I'm trying not to be judgmental in the way I'm telling the story, but I just realized, like, wow, I, like, I have a some preference for some liturgy. Liturgy that involves the congregation, responsive prayers, um, you know, sung hymns that we're all singing together. One thing I notice is that there are a lot of churches that have almost entirely men or only one woman visible up here. And, like right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I realized that when I did see the bodies of people of different genders, including women, I, I, my heart sang. Um, there was one Sunday, it was the Sunday with the communion, I, um, I, I came out and I thought, I'm just going to like, like our, our service right here is halfway through, I'm just going to like, just check in on YouTube. And it came up, and it was Pastor Rachel and Owen Thomas leading communion that day. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's my church, that's my church. Um, uh, so I just, I, I appreciated that, I appreciated that about our church, that we have, that we have a woman who is a pastor, that we have women in positions of leadership. There were, again, like I said, there were some services where not a single woman was visible in leadership. Um, I loved visiting Wellspring UCC Church, which is the historical, um, Samoan church on Fulton. It used to be, a uh, first, uh, con Samoan Congregational Christian Church, and they were very, uh, one they were wonderfully welcoming. Um, uh, Eddie and Omai are the pastor and pastor's wife, and they, I just, I tried to come in and just sit in the back, and they noticed that I was there, and they knew me, and they made a big point several times about, we're so honored to have Pastor Benjamin here, and so they're going on sabbatical in August, September, October, and they said they would visit, so I need to put like a post-it on the pulpit, like, Eddie and Omai, whenever they show up, <laughs> I'm going to honor them with a, with, a, with a greeting. It felt wonderful. That one distinctive thing about that service is the entire thing was bilingual, English and Samoan. And, you know, for those of you who have ever, like, had to uh, preach or give a speech in two languages while uh, translating yourself, it's exhausting. And I was so impressed with how Eddie was able to do that and, and move back and forth between English and Samoan. And that's one prayer I have. Like, there's really no reason for us not to be in much deeper fellowship with that congregation. Uh, they're really, really wonderful. So those, those are some things about the visits I made. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want it to be like, a, like you know, the New York Times critic goes to the church and picks it apart. I really like, I really tried to just say, what, what are the, what things can I lift up that I really appreciated about this community? Yeah. Yep. Were there any hints of politics in the churches you visited? Not partisan politics. And even a church that I went to, which I would describe as kind of, kind of more conservative, um, there, there was a mention in the sermon about um, ba basically 
that our, that our ultimate faith should be in God and that we often want to put our faith in people and that when it comes to politics, if we put too much of our faith in people, <laughs> we're always going to be disappointed. And the, the pastor, again, in, in this, I would put them on the more conservative side, of, said it in a very even way. Uh, which I appreciated, and I said to him afterwards, um, as, a, as a more liberal identifying person, worshiping with a more congregation, I felt included in that. Um, and I think I want to find ways that we can do that as well in our congregation, so we don't just become kind of one brand of Christian, but can try to have a bigger tent. Yeah. So it's a little after two, Ben. Yeah. How would you like to close? Yeah, why don't I close with just one more, one more reading, if that's okay? Um, and just, again, just to say thank you, everybody, for coming and being here. Thank you to Aaron for sticking around and, and making sure our live stream and, and audio could happen uh, today. Uh, thank you, Bob, for um, hosting this. He mentioned at the outset he wasn't feeling super well, so um, thank you for uh, stealing the nerve and, and coming. And... And also um, my wife, Brooke, and my son, Marin, are here, and it means a lot to me that you are here. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do the sabbatical without Brooke. Um. Yeah. Yeah, she... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a sermon reference? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Great, so this, so this parting reading is, uh, I'll kind of give it to you as a blessing. And um, yeah, I tried not to pay too much, well, I tried not to pay too much attention to how my blog posts were being responded to, but this was the one that got quite a bit of response. Um, and the, the image on the front of it is a picture that I took while on, on a hike with Brooke in Calistoga. This is part of the burn uh, scar in Calistoga. And, so these burnt trees and then the shadow of the trees, because we went in the morning, make, made kind of a grid. Um, and the, the poem I wrote is called, You Need to Know This. You need to know this, that you are infinitely held, that with all the voices jockeying for position, to talk you out of who you are, this voice matters most. The voice underneath, beyond, and inclusive of the rest, saying, you are loved as you are, exactly as you are. There is nothing to prove. There is no deed to perform. There is no one to impress, and that includes yourself. Before you were born, I knew you, the voice says. While you were precognitive, while you were prelingual, while you were blissed out in a field of no distinctions, one with mother, you saw the world face to face, the way God sees you now. Steeped in your created and gifted essence, the demands of culture and economy and politics and family mores don't come close to touching the belovedness that is you, the beauty that is you, the bountiful ball of love that is your unique presence on the earth. You are a miracle of miracles, not because of any achievement, but because that is the essence of who you are not only to God, but to all whom you encounter. Don't despair if they can't see it, can't accept it, can't name it. See it for yourself. Accept it in yourself. Name it of yourself. All that is necessary will follow. As you learn to love yourself and your neighbor the way that God has loved you, from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon.